some other quick upcoming events before we dive into today's, into today's presentation. Um, next week on March 16th, we'll, doing a, we'll be doing a webinar partnership on implicit bias and philanthropy with EPIP. Uh, in early April, we'll be, re we'll be releasing a report on the New York Community Trust. Um, in mid-April, we'll be doing a little mini webinar series for our non-grant making nonprofit members on fundraising. Uh, we'll be doing another webinar in April on faith-based strategies for social justice. Uh, and we'll also be having our impact awards in early May, uh, which will be lifting up um, funders in the field who are making some great strides toward equity. Today, um, our hashtag is Civic Adventure, so we encourage you to engage with us on social media and with our panelists, uh, whose um, uh, handles are listed here. Uh, we're looking forward to a great conversation with you today. As for our agenda, uh, first we'll give a brief introduction of our presenters and share why this topic is so important. Then we're going to have two interactive scenarios instead of just talking at you the entire time. Um, so the way that will work is that in each scenario, you'll answer three questions that ask you to make a decision around civic engagement. You'll be given those questions through our interactive polling feature, which I'll walk you through. In the first scenario, uh, you'll pretend to be the executive director of a 501c3 nonprofit. And in the second scenario, you'll pretend to be the head of a private foundation. After each scenario, you'll get to hear from an expert who will tell you about the real life case study that inspired that scenario. And you'll get to ask them questions. Finally, we'll end with a recap from uh, NTRP's resident civic engagement expert, Dan Pedagorski, who is NTRP's senior fellow. The whole session today will take about an hour and 15 minutes and will end at 2.30 Eastern time or 11.30 Pacific time. I will now turn it over to Dan to introduce our presenters and share why we chose this topic today. Thanks, Ben, and uh, good morning, everyone, or at least uh, those of you in the West. Good afternoon, those of you in the East. Um, you know, when we engage in long-range planning, we often talk about strategy as a roadmap to success. In social change work, though, our paths are more like multi-lane highways than single-lane roads. And while you might settle into one lane, you still need to negotiate your way on and off the freeway, decide which way to go when the highway forks off in different directions. Sometimes you may need to change lanes in response to traffic patterns or to move your way around a wreck. In civic engagement work, though, we often tend to get preoccupied uh, looking in the rearview mirror, uh, afraid that at any minute we'll have to pull to the side of the road when we see those lights flashing behind us. Um, and while we frequently work with an acute awareness of the legal constraints on C3 organizations and private foundations, on the ground, the work develops much more organically with C3 nonprofits and foundations working as part of a larger ecosystem that includes others who aren't subject to those same constraints and whose roles are in fact necessary to achieve broader success. So today we're going to look at scenarios where both organizers and funders have achieved success through a strategic understanding of how they work within that kind of an ecosystem. We're going to allow you to test your navigational IQs through those scenarios, putting you in the position of nonprofit and foundation decision makers as a way to help you assess your own readiness to evaluate your options in relation to the complementary work of others who work alongside you. Uh, the scenarios are based on real life examples, which our speakers will go on to discuss. And they feature an array of organizations and foundations that pursue different strategies, or in our metaphor, that occupy different lanes on that social change highway. Uh, some groups are ones that uh, file lawsuits. Others develop and run ballot measure campaigns, while still others uh, provide support to candidates who are running for office. While your own institutions may not be able to engage in all of those activities, understanding the array of C3 and C4 players can actually affect what you decide to fund or to work on. 
For example, you need to know that even if you can't engage in or fund the other pieces, if they're necessary for success writ large, then you need to evaluate whether others are indeed taking on those roles that you can't. And if they aren't, your individual piece may succeed, but the overall project will not. So with that, I'll turn things uh, back over to Ben, and we'll start with the first scenario. Great, uh, and I'll just do a brief introduction of the folks we have on the call today as our panelists. So you just heard from Dan Pedagorski, who is the Senior Fellow at NCRP. Uh, we're also excited that today we have uh, George Chung, who is a Program Officer at a private foundation in the Midwest, and Lenny Noisette, who is Director of the Justice Fund for U.S. Programs at the Open Society Foundation. So uh, now it's time uh, for the fun to begin. Um, so again, I will read you the scenario and then ask you to answer three questions through our polling feature. Um, when I start the poll, it should automatically appear uh, and you'll be able to answer it that way. So here is the scenario. Imagine that you're the executive director of a 501c3 nonprofit that works with community members to identify the issues most important to them and create change. The latest census has your community growing in record numbers, but elected officials never seem to pay attention to the community's interests. Your members are tired of feeling like they have no voice. So take a minute to let that sink in, uh, and then I will start our first question. So I have just uh, opened the, the first poll. It says, you organize a meeting together with other organizations that work in the community to discuss what you should do. A lot of folks get excited about running a ballot initiative campaign to change the way voting districts are drawn to make them more representative of the full community. What's your response? So, Got about 30 seconds left to make your choice. We have a few folks uh, plugging in already, so keep it coming. Got about 10 seconds left. All right, finishing up here. <clears throat> so, um, most folks, 15 folks said, great idea, will inform the public about the ballot initiatives. Uh, 10 folks said, great idea, will support the campaign and advocate for its adoption. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna go through the other two decisions now. Um, we'll share some thoughts based on the results and then we'll uh, jump in to talking to George. Here is uh, the second question. It says, you decide to spend some of the organization's time lobbying in favor of the ballot initiative up to the legal limit for a 501c3. Which of these activities, if any, will count toward your lobbying budget? And you can choose any. All right, you've got about 30 seconds left. Okay, just another moment. All 
All right. So, 42% said that educating public office holders and candidates on the issue will be lobbying. 39% uh, said talking with C4 organizations about strategy will be lobbying. 19% uh, said distributing educational voter guides would be lobbying, and 65% the most said that encouraging people to vote in favor of the ballot initiative would be lobbying. Again, we'll show an analysis of these questions after the third one. All right, final question for this scenario. Opening now. So the question says, by a narrow margin, the ballot measure fails. However, allies over at a legal advocacy organization tell you that the voting patterns displayed in the election are enough evidence to make a legal case that the district alliance were drawn with racial bias. They want to bring a lawsuit to challenge the voting districts and ask for your organization's help. How does your organization respond? Choose one. All right, you've got about 30 seconds left. Okay. As for the poll results, 76% said Jonathan will start by helping to identify plaintiffs and spreading awareness. 14% uh, said they thought it was illegal, so they couldn't support lawsuits. And 10% said that they couldn't support it because their lobbying budget was full. All right, well, you've made the three decisions. Uh, Dan is going to uh, walk you through now um, those, those scenarios. Good morning again, or good afternoon again. So I can see from the responses that this is a relatively uh, savvy bunch with a decently high IQ around the idea of lobbying and 501c3s in general. Uh, of course, uh, lobbying activities are generally permissible for 501c3 organizations within certain limits. So uh, in that sense then, uh, for that question, decision number one, uh, it's perfectly fine uh, as people indicated in B uh, for, uh, for you to uh, participate in the initiative, actually uh, sending around informational material that they're neutral isn't even lobbying, so wouldn't count as lobbying. Uh, C, uh, advocating for or against the initiative uh, is perfectly permissible as a lobbying activity it's, as long as it's within your limit. Do we want to move to number two? Okay, uh, this is one where uh, there seemed to be a little more confusion. Uh, most people said uh, that um, uh, on number uh, E, encouraging people to vote in favor of the ballot initiative. I think most of you uh, agreed that that was a good thing to do and that would be fine. It would count toward your lobbying budget. There were also though a fair number of people who had checked off uh, various uh, versions of A, B, C, and D as lobbying activities. Um, none of those would actually, uh, registering voters and getting out the vote wouldn't be lobbying. Uh, the other three would not necessarily be lobbying uh, either unless the voter guides you were distributing uh, advocated for or against the position. But if they just were educational explaining the position, uh, that wouldn't even count towards your lobbying cap. Okay, uh, moving on to decision three. Uh, this is one where I think uh, most of you uh, picked, and this is a great answer, number C, count us in. Uh, you know, uh, filing lawsuits, engaging in that type of activity is perfectly legal 
for 501c3s. So count us in as a fine answer, of course. Uh, B is a little deceptive because uh, you might be able to, you might in fact not have the budget to do any more on it, but it's not your lobbying budget that would be effective because filing the lawsuits doesn't have to do with lobbying. So again, congratulations. Most of you seem to be uh, pretty well up on this. Uh, and we will uh, clarify some of this as we go on in the real life examples uh, and also provide you links and materials that can help you sort that out. That's right. Thank you, Dan, for giving that overview. As we're going along today, folks, feel free to uh, make a note of your questions. We'll have Q&A uh, both after each case study, uh, but we'll also have Q&A towards the end. Dan will give another little wrap up, wrap up and you can ask questions there as well. So uh, make a note so you can bring those questions uh, to the group. So yeah. now we're going to um, move on to uh, George Chung talking about uh, the real life story that this case study was inspired by. Uh, hi, Dan, again. Uh, I, I'm happy to be able to introduce George, uh, who is currently a program officer at a private foundation in the Midwest. He's an active member of the Funders Committee for Civic Participation and the Donors Forum. Uh, and most relevant for this presentation, uh, previously, while he was living in Washington State, George was executive director at the Win-Win Network, which features very prominently in this, in this story. Uh, George was also the founder and executive director of Evil Rights Washington. Uh, he was an independent public affairs consultant. He's worked in civil rights law enforcement, focusing especially on fair housing compliance for agencies in Rhode Island, Massachusetts, and Washington. George holds a bachelor's degree in political science from Brown University and a master's in public policy from Harvard's Kennedy School of Government. So George, uh, let's hear what actually happened in Yakima. All right, thank you. Uh, thanks Ben and Dan for uh, organizing this call. Can everyone hear me? Yep. Great. Coming in loud and clear. All right. I'm going to start with my high school geometry class. Um, uh, Mr. Hall always said, you can't play the game unless you know the rules. I'll say that again. You can't play the game if you don't know the rules. So fast forward, uh, at the Win-Win Network, we really focused on increasing civic engagement and the voice for communities that were largely underrepresented. Uh, and in Washington State, uh, with a growing Latino community, uh, that really was in central Washington and the real kind of center of all of it was the city of Yakima. Uh, at the point when I was executive director, uh, Yakima had over 40% of its population Latino and never had they elected a Latino to city council before. So what were the rules that governed how they elected their uh, city council members? Next slide, please. The rules for the city council are that there were four districts, there were seven seats, four districts, uh, and three at-large seats. However, the districts were only in effect for the primary. Uh, therefore, all seven council members ran at-large in the general. So what you see here is a little map of Yakima, and those little uh, houses represent, at that point, uh, where the city council members lived. And you can see the cluster in the uh, center, uh, upper center uh, district where four of those city council members lived. Um, and so if we move to the next slide, uh, what you can see is the demographic um, trends. Uh, the darker the color, the higher concentration of Latinos. So you can see that uh, Latinos are very segregated onto the east side of the city. Uh, and so, uh, what happens is that though Latinos may be able to get someone of their choosing uh, to win a primary, uh, they have their votes diluted by the at-large voting system. Uh, and one of the and so in this situation, just registering uh, Latinos to vote and getting them out to vote uh, was simply just not enough uh, to translate that into a real voice on city council. Next slide, please. 
a good example is uh, the election of Sonia Rodriguez. Sonia was the first Latina to be appointed to city council, uh, and then when she ran for a, the position outright, you can see that uh, had there been a district on the northeast side of the city, uh, the deeper the purple color, the better that Sonia did, she would have handily won that district. Uh, but you can see that with the rest of the voting patterns, which are highly polarized, uh, Sonia Rodriguez uh, ends up uh, losing in the general election. And so we really thought about what can we do with the situation and uh, try to meet with as many people as uh, we could find to tell us uh, what would be a smart strategy moving forward with, once again, just registering people and getting them out to vote was simply not enough. <clears throat> we ended up uh, partnering with a number of voting rights litigators, particularly uh, Professor Joaquin Avila, who had led uh, a lot of voting rights work at MALDEF uh, in the 1980s, as well as the ACLU. And they basically told us that uh, though there were some very troubling trends in terms of voting rights and the dilution of um, Latinos' voting strength, that there simply just wasn't quite enough evidence of those racially polarized voting patterns outside of Sonia's race uh, to really make a solid lawsuit. And so what they told us was, we just need more evidence. If you could find another Latino to run and lose um, based on racially polarized voting patterns, that might be enough. Um, but, you know, it's really hard to recruit candidates who uh, are essentially serving as a sacrificial lamb um, in favor of a lawsuit. And so what we ended up doing was, um, if you could go to the next slide, please, we ended up running our own charter amendment campaign. Uh, so we looked at the charter, and it said that all we needed to do was gather 600 signatures uh, to qualify for the ballot, and 600 signatures, even for a small organization. We ended up starting a project called Central Washington Progress with an on-the-ground full-time organizer in the city. Uh, 600 signatures was not uh, out of the question. So we gathered about 600 signatures in three weeks, and, and the, the proposal was essentially to go to all districts, uh, carve uh, out seven districts in the city of Yakima. Staff engaged in a really aggressive media campaign, got lots of news coverage. Uh, we, as the campaign, really talked about this was about accountability uh, and not just about uh, people of color. But, of course, in a highly racially polarized situation, um, it became about people of color. Uh, I should also add that we, uh, the we at this point, was actually a separate campaign where we raised C4 dollars uh, to actually run the campaign, which, as Dan said, was lobbying. Uh, we lost uh, 42 to 58, which obviously was a blow to us. Uh, we had hoped to win, but um, given the uh, voting patterns, we were not surprised. Uh, and so this essentially gave the litigants, uh, the, the litigators, enough evidence to pursue uh, a voting rights case. And so the rest of the story, we kind of played our role. And because we had negotiated with the ACLU to, if we ran this campaign and if the results were racially polarized, that they would uh, move forward with a lawsuit. And so this is fully now two, almost three years after uh, the, this election, uh, the ACLU filed the lawsuit and after a couple of years succeeded uh, in knocking down this at-large voting system. And so the last elections, uh, city elections in November 2015, uh, ushered in a new era in which there were not one, not two, but three Latinas elected to city council uh, with an, another um, pro-Latino um, city council member uh, joining their ranks. Uh, and one of them, because it's a weak mayor system, one of the Latinas was selected as the first uh, Latina mayor of Yakima. Um, and so really quickly, just to kind of give my um, overall lessons learned, um, this was a slow and steady wins race strategy. So uh, this is really about focusing on the long-term systems change and being willing to fail. Of course, trying to tell a board that uh, we are likely to fail in this strategy, but it's part of the long game. Uh, might be hard to hear, but in the end, this is fully uh, five years later, uh, there's been dramatic change in representation in Yakima. The second is really to work with other partners to co-develop strategies across tax statuses, uh, because we had um, a 
an allied C4 organization and funders uh, on the C4 side who could support us, uh, we were able to kind of think broadly about what needed to happen and raise money in different buckets uh, to do what we needed to do uh, to allow for that division of labor with the uh, civil rights litigators in order to actually change the system. Uh, and finally, leadership development is just not just a frill. We worked also closely uh, with Progressive Majority who did a ton of trainings to recruit Latinos uh, to understand how to run a, a good campaign. Uh, and so what really is the use of changing a system if there's no one who's ready and prepared to, to run and govern? So I would say that those are the takeaways from this really exciting but very long-term strategy that we implemented. Um, and I'm happy to take any questions. Great, thank you, George, so much for sharing that story. Um, I know we a lot was packed in, a lot of great lessons. Um, so folks, if you have questions, uh, please submit them by going to your top right-hand corner, click on that button that says, looks like a question mark, and submit questions that way, and then we will uh, share them with George, he can answer. Perhaps I'll just add that we also did a ton of education of local human service organizations on the ground about lobbying, that this was not going to uh, jeopardize their tax status. So uh, I'm really excited to be part of this conversation because there's a lot of misinformation, particularly for uh, C3 organizations that don't do a lot of advocacy, but for which uh, moving their work forward in terms of lifting up people's voices and serving low-income communities, this was really important to have a Latino voice that shapes policy and allocates budgets uh, to make sure that those neighborhoods were well served. Great, thank you, George. Um, one question we have is, how did you all uh, decide on this strategy to begin with? Um, I would say that we did a big landscape analysis and looked at, in terms of Washington State, where were the biggest concentrations of communities of color? And it largely was um, Asian Americans, uh, African Americans and Latinos, uh, in King County, uh, where Seattle is, and that's where a ton of organizing already was happening. Uh, some African American communities in Pierce County just south, but the biggest concentration that was um, just so glaring a in terms of the disparity of <coughs> uh, concentrations of people of color and just the sheer lack of um, political representation, uh, a descriptive representation for those communities was Central Washington. And uh, a lot of the history was that there was a largely agricultural economy there and a lot of uh, migrant farm workers had come and gone. Uh, but over the last generation, a lot of them stayed and made the Central Washington, the Central Yakima Valley home. Uh, and so looking at those disparities, it became really clear that an investment in organizing and long-term systems change there uh, would make a big difference. I'll just also throw in that uh, it was important for us to build relations locally, particularly with human service organizations, but there weren't any Latino-led um, advocacy groups there. So we, we made the tough decision to actually create something new in terms of Central Washington, Central Washington progress, which is for other funders here, a question uh, of what happens if there isn't any organization doing advocacy work. If there's just human service organizations, they're not necessarily well equipped to do advocacy and systems change. Uh, so that's why we uh, very carefully um, brought in stakeholders and said, we're going to do something different uh, and still serve as a convener to build a larger strategy. But uh, that was a very significant decision to create an entity to really focus on organizing and um, systems change. Great. Uh, Anita asks, how much did this strategy cost? Any information you have about budget would be helpful. Um, our budget for the actual project, uh, and a lot of the money came through the Western State Center, which provided a ton of capacity building uh, and a very significant multi-year grant. Uh, I would say the budget was about um, seventy-five dollars to $100,000 a year for the project, and I think that we raised about maybe Twenty to thirty thousand dollars for the actual campaign itself. 
So it was essentially one full-time equivalent. That's the, basically the scope of the project, Central Washington Progress. Thanks, George. Uh, one other question from John is, um, do you think this kind of strategy or process it would be applicable in other states outside of Washington? Uh, absolutely. I think what's uh, instructive here is that <clears throat> we spent a lot of time not just staying in our lane, which was important, but trying to figure out what are all the other theories of change that could apply here. Uh, and so if I was just a litigator, I would look at Central Washington or Yakima and say, oh, uh, there's something going on, but there's just not quite enough there yet. So I'll just come back maybe in three or four years, and maybe there will be a few other races that happen that will allow me to then litigate under Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act to really change the system. So instead of everyone working in their silos, we just were relentless about talking to everyone who had some stake in systems change there and tried to figure out across our tax statuses and across our organization silos what would be the best strategy to create systems change uh, and then essentially had a plan that we could follow in terms of what role could we play and then hand the baton to others to carry the, the strategy forward. So I, I think that the most important thing as funders is to encourage uh, organizations to really work outside of their own silos and figure out what's a long-term strategy and then create a, a smart division of labor um, and figure out uh, a smart um, subsequent uh, division of funding to make sure that the whole larger plan can move forward, knowing that everyone has a piece of it, but no one's going to own the whole strategy. Awesome. Thank you, George. Uh, it looks like we don't have any more questions at the moment, uh, but we encourage all of you to keep thinking of questions. There will be more opportunities for you to ask questions later in the webinar. Um, so thank you again, George, for uh, sharing that story and your expertise. Um, great. So now we're going to move on uh, to the next scenario. Um, so again, we will read out a scenario to you, a setup. Uh, and then we'll ask you to answer three short polling questions. So uh, the first, the scenario is, imagine you're the executive director of a private grant-making foundation. Recently, your board has become interested in improving the criminal justice system. With that, um, I will open the first question. So it says, you've received some exciting grant applications from 501c3 nonprofits involved in community organizing and policy advocacy around the criminal justice system. Their plans include lobbying the legislature and exploring the viability of a statewide ballot initiative. How do you recommend funding them? Choose one. Uh, so folks, feel free to put in your answers now. Another 30 seconds or so. All right, just one moment. All right, um, most folks, um, about 57% chose to give a general operating support grant without earmarking against lobbying. Uh, a few other folks were scattered among uh, the other um, options, about two folks each. Uh, zero said they would earmark funds for lobbying. All right, and now the second question, opening now. It says, during the grant cycle, during your next grant cycle, some of your criminal justice grantees tell you they have a new project they think will be a game changer. 
but they'll need more lobbying money than their combined budgets as 50 combined lobbying budgets as 501c3s will allow. Uh, they secured initial support for a new 501c4 organization that will be able to lobby more and spearhead the ballot measure they now believe is feasible. What do you want to do? You can choose any. All right, folks, you got about uh, 30 more seconds. Okay. Okay, and sharing the poll results now. 56% said that they would continue providing funding to the existing 501c3 grants only. 24% uh, said they would provide funding to the new 501c4 organization. Uh, and 60% said that they would educate C4 funding colleagues about the initiative. All right, and the final polling question, open now, take a look. It says, other grant makers and donors who have been funding work to change the criminal justice system, including C4 funders, have invited you to a meeting to learn more about each other's work. So this includes C3 funders and C4 funders. What's your response? Choose one. All right, we'll give it another 30 seconds or so. Okay, sharing poll results now. 46% uh, said sure, I'll attend. I'll invite other funding colleagues to the meeting as well. 25% said count me in, let's figure out how to align our get out the vote and voter uh, registration plans. 18% uh, said sure, I'll attend, it would be good to learn more. And 7% said no, we can't talk to C4 organizations. Uh, thank you all for 
for uh, answering those questions. Uh, once again, I will let Dan do a, a walkthrough of how uh, you might think about uh, these choices. Hello again. Um, so uh, I'm, I'm not surprised that uh, given what we found out initially that most of you are pretty comfortable with uh, how to deal with lobbying in the context of this type of decision making. Private foundations, of course, are uh, different from public foundations and 501c3s because they are actually not allowed to engage uh, to, to fund lobbying efforts. However, um, while they can't specifically earmark funds for lobbying, it's also the case that they don't have to say that the groups they're funding cannot engage in lobbying. It's fine for 501c3 organizations who receive private foundation money to lobby. It's just they can't use those specified funds for lobbying if they're earmarked. Uh, so uh, in this question, uh, you, there are really two options. You can give a general support grant and keep funding the organization, or you can give a specific project grant as long as the amount of that grant doesn't exceed the non-lobbying portion of the project budget. So if a multi-issue organization has a uh, criminal justice uh, focus area and they're engaged in a ballot measure on that and the total project budget for their criminal justice work is $200,000, uh, you could actually earmark a grant for their criminal justice work for up to uh, $100,000 if the non-lobbying portion of the non-ballot measure portion of their work is $100,000. So you don't have to exclude them from working on it. You just can't earmark your money for that lobbying. So uh, on question number two, oh, and uh, question number two, uh, again, uh, I, I love the enthusiasm uh, on this. Uh, people are fine with continuing to fund the existing C3s, even though they're going to be uh, supporting uh, C4 efforts. Uh, there are some people who are uh, a little bit um, uh, overly enthusiastic on question number uh, two. Uh, I think there were uh, almost a quarter of you said you were going to provide funding to the new 501c4 organization. That actually is not kosher for a private foundation, and if you did that, you would be, uh, that would be tax, a taxable expenditure. Okay, and uh, on number three, uh, again, people were uh, properly uh, enthusiastic. Um, it's fine for you to talk to C4 partners. You just can't fund those C4 efforts, but finding out what colleagues are doing, uh, inviting people to meetings, uh, knowing the lay of the land and who's doing what, uh, that's perfectly fine. Okay. So, um, we are going to turn now to uh, the um, uh, what really happened section here. And uh, I'm going to introduce uh, Lenny Loisette. Uh, Lenny directs the Justice Fund for U.S. Programs at Open Society Foundations. Um, in that role, he leads the Foundation's efforts to reduce mass incarceration, eliminate harsh punishment, and promote system accountability. Prior to joining the Foundation, uh, Lenny served as the longtime Executive Director at, of the Neighborhood Defender Service of Harlem. Uh, an innovative public defender's office, which is renowned for its development of community-based full-service representation of clients. He was also a member of the Executive Session on Public Defense, which is sponsored by the Federal Bureau of Justice Assistance and the Kennedy School of Government. And in that capacity, he co-authored, The Best Defense is No Offense, Preventing Crime Through Effective Public Defense. Uh, Noisette received his BA from Queens College at the City of University of New York and his JD from New York University School of Law, and he's also an adjunct professor at Fordham University Law School. So, Lenny, we're really thrilled to um, have you here to talk about a remarkable initiative uh, in California. 
Thanks, Dan. Thanks, Ben. Um, hello, everyone. You can hear me. You can hear me all right. Yep. So well, thanks, I. It's been a pleasure to um, listen to the conversation and to join now and contribute to it. Uh, just one uh, additional point about me, because it's relevant to the story. Um, in addition to working for the Open Society Foundation's U.S. programs, which is um, part of the private foundation, we also um, have affiliated with the foundation network a C4 entity called Open Society Policy Center, and I serve as a staff member to that as well. And so that, that dual hat that I wear will become more relevant as I tell this story. So similar to the um, sort of scenario that you guys were confronted with or asked questions about, uh, our leadership um, in 2011 uh, decided that there were circumstances in California that suggested there was a real opportunity for us to advance criminal justice reform. The state was facing a very substantial budget crisis, and it also had um, recently been ordered by the U.S. Supreme Court to substantially reduce its uh, prison population as a result of a lawsuit that challenged uh, the overcrowding of the prisons there. And so those dual situations suggested to us that California, which at that time had the highest level of prison population in the country, was ripe for an opportunity to really push for more substantial reform. We have been funding criminal justice reform in California for many years. California has a relatively robust um, criminal justice uh, advocacy community, but they had not been making much success. Uh, we investigated what might be the most appropriate way to go forward, and the sense was that the traditional advocacy community there had really been pigeonholed as being too much of a civil libertarian, civil liberties uh, approach, and that what was needed was a more mainstream traditionist approach to reform. We got together with a number of funded partners and ultimately decided to create a new entity. So uh, with this first slide, this says building an infrastructure. It actually wasn't building an infrastructure. There was an infrastructure there. It was building a new infrastructure or adding an infrastructure. And I think that the funders who came to the table came, some of them were traditional criminal justice funders like we were, but the California Endowment, which was really a health foundation and began to see criminal justice issues from the health lens was there, as was the, the California Wellness Foundation, the Public Welfare Foundation had been supporting direct engagement with government as opposed to more traditional outside advocacy. So we had a unique mix of partners and we created a new entity as a project of the Tides um, Center, California's for Safety and Justice, to try to build a more mainstream centrist um, support for criminal justice reform. So we move to the next slide. Uh, Californians for Safety and Justice from the very beginning um, was envisioned as engaging in both C3 and C4 activities. Uh, we felt that it needed to build community support, public support for more robust criminal justice reform. So it was engaging in public education and advocacy efforts. We thought it was particularly important to expand the base of support for reform, so we were looking for law enforcement leaders who would be credible messengers. We were looking to engage the business community and labor community, understanding why criminal justice reform ought to be important for them by demonstrating that uh, there was excessive money being spent in that space that could be spent on something else. We um, also thought that there was some value in assisting local governments. California had just passed some legislation that uh, uh, delegated a lot of criminal justice responsibility to the local level, and localities were really having a hard time dealing with that new responsibility. So one of the things that California's and Safety and Justice did was um, to help them uh, deal with that new responsibility. But we also knew that it was going to be engaged in legislative advocacy, specifically around sentencing reform. And we envisioned at, at, at the time that we started it, there may be a ballot initiative down the line, but really had not uh, thought through what that might look like. And lastly, we wanted to engage in a uh, gay crime survivor victims community to encourage them to participate so that they could get more resources for their needs. So, Two years in, it seemed like there was even more of an opportunity than, uh, next slide, two years in, we thought there was even more opportunity for reform than we had initially imagined. 
um, public research, public opinion research indicated that voters were actually much more eager for robust reform than were the legislators who represented them, and that led us to create um, help creation of Californians for safe neighborhoods and schools to create a ballot initiative, Prop 47. Prop 47 really sought to do a couple of things. It sought to reduce six felony offenses to misdemeanor offenses by, uh, and thereby resulting in a number of people being eligible for immediate release from prison and thousands of others never having to go to, um, um, to prison because the charges they would be facing would only be misdemeanor charges. It, proposed to take the savings from reductions in prison populations and reallocate them to mental health services, prevention services, and victim services, and it allowed for people who had previously been convicted of these six offenses to go back into court and get their records expunged or records reduced to misdemeanors, thereby removing the barriers to employment, housing, and all the things that come with um, barriers that people face by virtue of having criminal records. Uh, so a ballot committee was established. We were fortunate enough to get law enforcement leaders to sponsor the bill. And um, OSF, uh, with the Open Society Policy Center, and my other hat, an Atlantic Advocacy Fund, which was affiliated, a C4 affiliated with Atlantic Philanthropies, um, became the lead funders. Um, Many folks came on to the, to the campaign, celebrities and artists endorsed the, the, the campaign effort. Um, and unlike many ballot initiatives, uh, the, the, you know, the focus here was not simply on a campaign that was going to focus on uh, paid media, television, uh, advertisements, which is what many consultants of these ballot initiatives uh, talk to you about. But, we also really were focusing on engaging community voter engagement, both to pass the ballot initiative, but also to build a base of support for um, criminal justice reform over the longer term, because this was just the beginning of things that we wanted to do. Next slide. So, you know, I told you who our partners were, and so the question becomes, well, what can some of those funders who were 501c3 funders do to support the effort? Well, it's our, our funder partners who could not contribute to the C4 nonetheless continued funding as an example and the answer to some of the questions indicated, continued funding some of the organizations on the C3 side that were engaged in public education uh, about the importance for criminal justice reform more, more generally. Uh, they engaged in research and analysis and a wide variety of communications and um, community engagement activities. The, the, the picture on the slide here is from a campaign the California Endowment uh, put up during the ballot initiative effort, which really was just showing the comparison for how much it costs to send a young person to prison versus how much it costs to send a, a person through, um, the, through school. And, then, and as an effort to demonstrate how much we were wasting money on prison that could be used for um, for more important purposes. And lastly, uh, the C3 organizations that we were partners with supported a lot of post-passage implementation activities uh, with the recognition that it's one thing to get the win, it's another thing to sustain the win and do the implementation as necessary for the, uh, for the win to really have the impact on the communities that we were concerned about. This last slide I share with you is really just an indication of the breadth of uh, activity and support that we had. It's probably hard to see, so there's a link that um, Ben will provide to you so that you can see it more fully. We get a kick out of it because it was a web of conspiracy that a local reporter tried to portray to demonstrate how many different sort of sources, some nefarious like George Soros, who was the head of the Open Society Foundations, were, were who were involved in the effort to get Proposition 47 passed and where all the money was coming from. But we take pride in the slide because it just shows the number of organizations that were either directly or indirectly involved in support of the campaign and ultimately passage of the campaign. Because what I didn't say is that the ballot initiative passed with 60% of the vote of, of voters of California. So it, was, it passed as one of the highest um, wins in recent history for ballot initiatives that existed in California. I think that the largest takeaway, I take two takeaways. One is this slide, which shows 
the various roles that organizations, C3, C4, private individuals can play in a campaign and what role foundations can play in helping to lead the effort. And second, I would um, just say the importance of having a ground game leading up to the campaign was really important because now there is such enthusiasm by the people who see Prop 47 as their win um, for making sure that folks get their records expunged, making sure that there's no pushing back on the win thus far, and more importantly, uh, interested in taking reform forward and um, deeper into the criminal justice system. So with that, I'll stop. Great. Uh, th thank you, Lenny. Um, and we'll now uh, open it up for questions about Lenny's presentation. Yes, thank you, Lenny and everyone. Again, you can use that Q&A icon, uh, the blue box with the question mark in the upper right-hand corner to submit your questions. Um, one question we have is, um, so that, that the network uh, showed a lot of various actors involved. Can you talk about how smaller foundations with less disposable income could have become involved in a project like this? Yeah, I'll, I'll give one example. So, um, you know, I think that there were lots of um, needs that we had in the campaign. For example, I talked about the local initiative of how to deal with reform at the local level. One real issue was how do you uh, make sure that people who are released from the justice system have appropriate housing. So there was a small foundation that had a housing portfolio who contributed to the effort by supporting the development of supported housing and access to housing for people with criminal records. Uh, it was a really modest investment, but it was really helping local government thinking about how to deal with that challenge. So I think that um, smaller foundations that may have more narrow portfolios, to the extent that you see connection between the issues that are the priorities of the foundation with the um, issues of criminal justice reform, I think they present many opportunities. Thank you, Lenny. Uh, Courtney also asks, what were some of the challenges of being one player in a campaign of this magnitude? Well, I mean, I, I think that there were fewer challenges because we created this new entity that we were all comfortable with driving the um, driving the campaign effort and we were confident with the leadership there and so we deferred to many of these decisions. I think that funders came in at various levels of financial commitment and I think there were times when people felt that their voice wasn't um, as valued, uh, so foundation colleagues who didn't feel like maybe they had the kind of input that they would have liked to have had. So I think a challenge of um, equal participation and equal representation is one challenge. I think the other challenge is that because we created a new entity and there were pre-existing players, how we, how the new entity and ourselves as funders who were funding some of these pre-existing players, how to navigate um, the new funding and the new dynamics that we created by imposing ourselves and a new player in the space was also challenging. Great, and, and one final question for you, Lenny. Um, Suzanne says, you know, criminal justice is a topic that's getting more attention in the news right now. Do you think this approach could work for an issue that perhaps is less salient? All right. Yeah, I mean, I, I think you can because I think we took advantage of a moment, but I think part of what we did was we made the issue more salient for a broader um, base, a broader constituency. So the labor community in California was not initially involved in justice reform issues, nor was public education and education unions. I think to the extent that we help people understand why this issue ought to be important to them, that it became a more salient issue. So while it was that's different than it being salient in the public, I think how you build political will or public will for something is a lesson here as well. 
Great. Thank you, Lenny. I'm going to share with you one more question uh, from Amy, and then we'll move on to Dan doing a, a wrap-up here. Um, Amy asks, what are some strategies for building up a criminal justice infrastructure in places where that does not yet exist? You mentioned that California already had an infrastructure in place, but what are first steps for places with few existing players? I mean, I, I think engaging at the local level or in places and spaces where people are directly affected is a good place to start. Um, you know, one of the things that we learned here and were able to take advantage of is the interest in communities that are hard hit by criminal justice policies in being part of the solution. And, you know, there are, there's more willingness for communities to recognize leadership of formerly incarcerated people, folks who are impacted, families who are impacted by incarceration. So I think the people who care about it the most will engage on the issue if they are provided with the resources and um, organizational capacity to do so. You know, that that is actually a great segue uh, to, I think, summing up, Lenny, because I think it really uh, ties to something that George mentioned about the work in central Washington, which is that uh, it often can take years of investment, and it largely is C3 investment, to develop the leadership and capacity in community organizations and leaders um, way before you're able to take on the level of systems change or ballot measure work uh, that these particular campaigns that Lenny and uh, George uh, have been talking about can actually get into gear. And so uh, even though we're focusing on, uh, you know, in narrow terms, those very dynamic campaigns that won systems change and criminal justice reform in Yakima and in, uh, and in California statewide, that patient building work is really the essence and most appropriate use of C3 dollars, even staying in those C3 lanes and it's necessary, it's actually much longer term work. And one of the things that tends to happen um, when in campaign funding is that uh, when people receive campaign funding and especially C4 money, uh, it's often uh, short term money. It's for very specific objectives and very um, uh, specific deliverables related to that campaign. And that's what campaigns are about. So it's very complementary to the kind of longer term C3 funding that private foundations provide that's absolutely essential that provides you with the resources, the people, the motivation, the research, the consciousness of issues that's necessary if you're gonna mount the campaign in the first place. And so I think what we're especially trying to focus on here is the way those interact with one another. And so uh, it's, it's a mistake to somehow see uh, certain aspects of civic engagement as, you know, minefields that are fraught with peril for C3 organizations. Uh, in fact, they're not. They're opportunities to engage in your work with a consciousness of what allies are doing to move the work in different arenas, which are actually necessary for your own success, and to see how those uh, play alongside one another. So to go back to, uh, to George's example in Yakima, um, the, uh, a researcher named uh, Hari Han, who's based in uh, California now, uh, has put it, you know, uh, lowering barriers through systemic reform alone has limited impact if we build it, people will not necessarily come. So that if you had decided you wanted to uh, shift the rules of the game in a place like Yakima, um, but you hadn't done the work alongside that to prepare leaders who'd be able to step forward to take advantage of that, the reform would have been um, meaningless. Some of that leadership development can happen through your ongoing C3 investments, but then after the reform is in place, you then have to have 
uh, C4 and hard money efforts that can actually support and help those candidates win. So they're mutually reinforcing roles, all of which are critical um, if those reforms are going to be meaningful. And uh, I think that's probably the most important thing uh, that we want to be able to convey today. Um, I would also note in relation to uh, Lenny's examples uh, in California and also what George was saying about the relationship of the lawsuit, that you know the, the legal strategies and the lobbying and ballot measure strategies uh, can work hand in hand in extremely productive ways uh, and, and have to be uh, developed uh, to, alongside each other. So in Yakima, as George noted, the um, ballot measure that initially failed provided the research and documentation necessary for the ballot measure for the lawsuit to succeed, and it was the lawsuit that then blew everything open and got the change people wanted. There was a parallel effort in Anaheim, uh, California, a few years ago, which was also the largest city in um, California that still had uh, citywide as opposed to district elections, where it was almost the reverse, where a network of community organizations um, was uh, pressuring and got together and filed a lawsuit against the city council of Anaheim, which was 100% white, even though the city it was now well over 50% uh, people of color. And it was that lawsuit that then uh, spurred the city council as a way to settle it to put a ballot measure on the ballot to move to district elections. So it was kind of the reverse of the process with the, process with the lawsuit, uh, giving way to the ballot measure, which then won the reform. So they, they need to work together. You need to work together with these uh, in a complementary way. So um, I'm going to turn it over to Ben in a couple of minutes to talk about uh, resources that we can provide uh, and some closing comments. I just wanted to see if there are any final questions uh, from participants. Okay, and if not, any, sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead, Dan. I was going to say, um, it doesn't look like we have any questions now, but in these last few minutes, folks, if something is burning, uh, you can submit it through that Q&A tab. Uh, you can also always uh, send us a follow-up question uh, via email afterwards or, or via Twitter. Great. Thank you, Dan, for summing things up for us. Um, so here are some resources uh, that Dan alluded to. Uh, we'll be sending out, um, uh, we'll be posting the slides and the recording from today on our website. We'll be sending them out as well. Um, a lot of today's webinar was inspired by our latest issue of Responsive Philanthropy, our quarterly journal here at NCRP, which is all focused on civic engagement. Uh, George Chung wrote a fantastic piece on Yakima and that case study for that journal, so we really encourage you to check that out. Um, there's also a great guide called the Philanthropy Advocacy Playbook um, from uh, the uh, Advocates for Justice, Alliance for Justice, uh, which has some really great helpful tips uh, to foundations and nonprofits alike about all of these C3 and C4 rules that are really, really clear and helpful. Uh, you can learn more about the case study that Lenny talked about uh, through this link here that shows that map in greater detail. Uh, and you can also just explore these other links at your leisure. There's a lot of great information out there and, and practice opportunities to think through uh, how to support this work, whether you're a nonprofit or a funder. Uh, and we encourage you to check out these resources, including our report. We encourage you to not let the conversation stop here. So uh, talk to your peers. Uh, engage with us. Uh, we're always happy to help folks uh, think through things and, and um, uh, be more bold in the ways that they engage in these important uh, topics. So please engage with us as well. Um, I wanted to give our panelists, uh, Dan, George, and Lenny, uh, a chance to share any final thoughts they have as we close out today. This is George. I would just encourage folks to um, uh, have their grantees think really outside the box because everyone can be part of a great strategy, but no one's going to own it all themselves. 
Yeah, I, this is Lenny. I just sort of reiterate, I heard in Georgia's story and in Ben's comments, uh, the really important uh, uh, consideration or con observation that ultimately uh, these efforts are successful and sustainable with near some attention to building long-term leadership and civic capacity. And so the, the short-term win sometimes obscures the fact that there's a lot that has gone into kind of building the um, capacity to make it happen. Yes, and, and on that score, um, you know, one of the concepts people uh, use to talk about this work is looking when you're investing in both uh, profits and in assets. It's one thing to invest in a way that earns you short-term profits, but uh, as you're earning those profits and expecting those rewards, if you're not also building up your base of assets, uh, your ability to uh, win those and, and uh, generate those profits in the future is going to be undermined. And finally, um, I think we have a pretty uh, enlightened group here uh, in terms of your consciousness of what you can and can't do. My experience is often, though, that while program officers are well aware of this, that the language of uh, application procedures, guidelines, and especially grant agreements uh, can often be surprisingly and unnecessarily restrictive uh, and even cut against the grain of what we know and actually recommend uh, and, and um, know and support through groups like Alliance for Justice uh, and elsewhere. So I'd urge people, in addition to your own uh, proselytizing and work with uh, allies or, in Lenny's term, uh, uh, your unindicted co-conspirators, um, that you also look at your own internal documents and make sure that you're sending the right message to grantees and prospective grantees uh, in that wording. So uh, thank you all. I encourage you to make use of the resources that Ben mentioned, uh, and we really appreciate your participation. And thank you. Thank you, everyone, for sharing your time with us today. Uh, we'll send the recording and slides out shortly. But until then, uh, have a wonderful Thursday. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.